Matt, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Brilliant. Thanks for having me, Andy. Well, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, really great to have you here, Matt. And obviously, we're good friends. We've known each other in the property space for quite some time now. You're a member of the Mastermind. So I guess I've got a good insight into you and your businesses. But to kick off, it would be brilliant if you could share with our listeners a bit more about you, Matt, and what your business interests currently look like. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I'm based in, in Norwich, so I think geographically for, for property, that's probably quite important to, to know about what, what I do. Um, I've got kind of two sides of me property-wise. Uh, one is an avid investor, uh, just love, I have a genuine passion for property. I just, I love, I love property. Um, even better if it can, can, can keep me in sort of a full-time job. Um, <laughs> if you so, can make money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, make money as well. Even we're allowed to say that on the podcast, Matt. <laughs> if you can make good money, we're, yeah, we're, we're even happier. Yeah. Um, so, so, so there's the investing side, which I'm really keen on. Um, and so started HMOs 2012 um, and kind of got, got a plan for the next, at least next sort of 15 years of, of growing property, grow my por- property portfolio, etc. And I know to support my my HMO portfolio especially, it needs to be looked after by a really good agent. Um, and here in Norwich there isn't any there isn't anybody who does really good full HMO management. So decided about a year and a half ago to set up my own agency, which is AM Living. Um, AM Living started as my kind of property brand so in 2012, started as my personal property brand um, and has now developed into um, a property brand in Norwich known for HMO specialist management um, and in the tenant market, just, just really, really nice properties. Um, and then to kind of separate away from that, I created um, Investing UK, which is just uh, more of a kind of a page where it's a space where I share the deals side um, and look more at the numbers. Um, so that's, I mean, that, that's pretty much where I am in properties at the moment is I'm an investor and I've got a, a managing agency. And you, you manage quite a few HMOs now, don't you, Mark? You think you're quite kind of modest about, about that number as well. That, that, that management yeah. agency has been growing really quickly, hasn't it? Yeah, so we've taken on, um, we've taken on around two HMOs a month since we started, so sort of about a year and a half ago, um, and it's still growing. That that's roughly our the, the speed. That that's the rate we've stayed at, and we've, we're still at at the moment. So I think we've got two six beds coming on next month. Um, yeah, that's that's roughly where we've been, and it's quite a nice it's quite a nice pace to scale at because it means we can develop and change um, all of our systems and processes as we go along. So at the beginning, I was when I started it, I had my own, I probably had about 40 to 50 of my own rooms that I owned, um, and which which you can just about do with a spreadsheet, I think. You can just about do a sort of a phone, a laptop, and a spreadsheet. Um, but I knew scaling it to where I wanted to be and where I wanted to take it, we'd need to take advantage of Good proper systems and processes, tried and tested systems and processes um, to to scale it, and so it's been quite a nice pace to be able to integrate all those things as as we go along, um, and it not be too painful. Like each time you change a, a sort of systems and process, it's quite painful, I think, or can be, especially if you're a big company. But because we've been doing it organically, it's it's have been fairly easy, I think. I, I say that, though I'm not necessarily <laughs> the one who's got to do it. Well, well, I completely agree. And, and, and having grown an agency myself, uh, you know, uh, ha- have been through, uh, you know, all those ups and downs of, 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 of taking on properties and working with landlords and, and everything else that's involved. And I'm sure, and in fact, I'd like to come on to some of that in the in the podcast today. And I know you'll be honest about uh, that experience for you. But before we go there, and just to recap, so you started off investing personally, things were going well, and you yeah. wanted to take that to another level. And you also needed a, a property manager. So actually, you started your own agency, you spotted a, a gap in the, the market down there, and you've been growing that agency simultaneously. And 
Do you do any investment work with the private investors, Matt, or is all of your investment stuff just yours? Uh, it's mainly just mine, um, but I've got, I'm now in a position where I sort of made a, a point of wanting to use external investment from sort of mid-year last year. Um, and we're now at the moment at a point where I've got three or four people that have said what they want to invest, how much they've got, what they'd be interested in doing. Um, and I've got a, over the last month or two proposals going out properties that we've found that would be of interest to other people. Um, so I'm at the point where I'm just starting to work with with what I've called like true joint venture partners. Um, prior to this, I've had a couple of joint venture partners where we've put money in 50-50, we've done the work 50-50. Um, so it's been more sharing the experience, sharing um, the, the risk, I suppose. Um, but going forward, I, I want to do it in more of a true sense um, of joint venture. And then prior to that, I've done, um, my parents weren't in property. So I've grown up with a love of property because of my parents. So growing up in like a, a barn development from the age of seven, which they still haven't finished. Um, <laughs> I've, I've always had kind of a, a love of that and love of like, my seeing my mum create the spaces, um, seeing like my dad work more on like the, the structural side and things like that. I really enjoyed it. So after they saw me having success with it in uh, sort of 2012 onwards, I'm gonna convince them to do um, four large HMOs now, which provides them a great source of income. Um, so I've got joint venture experience in the sense of that as well. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's for my parents, so they get it you know, managed. I source it for free, uh, set it up for free, and man manage it for free, so they get a pretty good deal. I'm just they get made no, nurturing my inheritance. <laughs> <laughs> Keep that nest egg very, very warm. Well, it, it sounds like a, you know, a really natural progression for, for, for you, this, Matt. And one of my favorite things about you is how humble you are about some of the stuff that you've done and what you've created and what you're doing. I remember when we were booking the podcast, and you said, Andy, I don't know if there's really much I can I can come on and, and 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 offer. I've got nothing to sell. And I said, Matt, that is exactly why I want you on the podcast because you're very honest about everything you do. Um, your priority is building your business, building your yeah. um, portfolio and for anybody who's already following you, and, and, and certainly I, I know, the stuff that you do and have created already is really incredible. Next level stuff, some of the, the best professional accommodation I've ever seen. Um, and you're, you're a key member of, of the Mastermind as well, uh, a great resource of, of advice for, for many people. So you offer a huge amount to, to the community and, and anyone not following you yet, I would really recommend does go and follow you and checks out some of the stuff that you're doing. but. The big question, the, the really big question that I want to ask you right now is why HMOs? Because that doesn't seem as obvious to me. Most people, when we talk about the, the background you know, and why they got started in, in, in HMOs, maybe they came from university or realised what their landlord was doing and thought there's a lot of money to be made. My landlord's kind of creaming it here. I want to do a bit of what he's doing or some other transactions. But you know, what was the attraction for you with HMOs? So I think um, probably actually a little bit of what you just said about a, a student um, seeing what their landlord was doing. So when I lived uh, when I lived in London, so 2005, maybe six, um, I started at UCL in central London. Um, Were they hazy my... days, Matt? Yeah, <laughs> just a bit. <laughs> yeah. um, and I was... I mean, my first year, you put into halls, um, and I think I was paying, bear in mind, this is like 15 years ago, I was paying a good eight, nine pounds a month for an ensuite room in Zone 1. Um, and at the time, there were, I always looked at property, always looked from right move, whatever it was, was even right move back then? <laughs> I think it was. Um, and I always looked at properties, and there were plenty of large one-bedroom flats going for under £200,000. Um, and I like did the figures and I just thought, thought to myself, look, if I find a, a one bed flat with a private living room, private bedroom, private kitchen, I'll rent out the bedroom for 800 quid a month. I'll live in the living room and 
you know, the mortgage, and that's exactly what I did. The mortgage was um, like, I don't know, 200 pounds. I've got my bills on top of that. I was a student, so no council tax. Um, and I was, I managed to live in zone one, like King's Cross, Central King's Cross, um, in a place that I'd kind of got my parents to purchase. Um, I was living there rent free, bills free, getting pocket money each month. Um, on my parents don't have like masses of money, but they would have had to have supported me through years two, three, and four at university. So it kind of, and then at the end of the five years when we sold the flat, it made my parents a huge amount of money. Um, so I kind of thought, I want to do this room renting thing on a larger scale. So I saw it in London back in 2005 onwards. Um, and I just thought, I'm going to do this in Norwich. So I moved back to Norwich um, and decided, like, I had a full-time job, had a good engineering job. Um, but I decided I wanted to get into property at some point point so I was always on the lookout for properties um, and the first thing I came across was a derelict 240 square meter property um, and bought it so that was my first my first experience was I turned it into an eight bed HMO um, in terms of why I suppose I knew it would cash flow really well um, so, so I knew it was going to be of financial significance to have it um, I also, I've got such a passion for old properties, Victorian properties especially. Um, and this was a Victor beautiful Victorian property, sort of three and a half, four metre ceilings, loads of like metre and a half roses. I was just like, I want, you know, I want to be up on the ceiling, take the scraping 100 years of paint, paint off these things and stuff like that. So I just wanted to get into property and it wasn't it's at that time it certainly wasn't from a spreadsheet it certainly wasn't i didn't do the numbers on it i just knew it would i knew it would be a winner um i knew i couldn't lose on it financially um and i think that one i purchased 2012 purchased for two three five and the last valuation was six two five Wow. Um, so nine years later, um, but I probably spent less than a hundred grand on it because I did. I was in there for twelve months doing the work myself. And um, with that property map, were you thinking about capital appreciation as well as the rental yield, or was it just you know the icing on the cake when the value started to go up, and then you were able to start crystallising some of it? At the time, I wasn't at all. I wasn't thinking about that at all. Um, I think I was probably thinking, I was probably just trying to get by originally. Um, trying to, I probably ran it for, I don't know, a year or two without knowing about all the HMO rules and regulations. Um, so, but then it was 2016, I thought I need, it's a massive building, I need to release some capital from this building. Um, and looked at various things. So I looked at next, the two identical houses either side are split into four two-bedroom flats. So I seriously looked at changing it into, into these four flats, but I was looking at probably 150, 200 grand cost to do the works. Um, and I just thought, look, if I make this into an absolutely stunning eight-bedroom home with a stunning kitchen and living space, just on kind of square meterage comparables in the area, it was going to get valued at 550 um, back in 2016. So, and that was without spending an extra penny on it. So, in 2000, end of 2016, I managed to get it valued at 550 um, and pulled as much money out then as I would have done if I'd have spent 200 and got it valued at four flats. Um, yeah, so that's it, was it essentially was the icing on, on the cake, it wasn't planned from the beginning. And this, you know, that project was the foundation for, for your case study, was it? The case study that we're going to talk about today, was that project and the way that that went and the equity that you were able to release, was that the foundation for the project in today's case study that we're going to discuss? Yeah, definitely. So in the, between 2013, when that house was finished, and 2016, I worked for some London investors um, and they purchased in Norwich and they um, they very sort of uh, quite strict criteria for their for their properties it was they were all very similar 
Um, but I looked after the properties. I learned a lot during that time about tenant management. But I also learned a lot about investing during that time. So I learned a huge amount from them. Um, was that a role you decided to take actively because you already knew you wanted to do your own stuff, Matt? Or was that just part of the natural progression towards doing your own stuff? Was that where you developed some of the love for it? Um, it was... It was I. Done, I spent the year doing the property 2012, 2013. I'd let all the rooms out and I was like, I want to stay in property full time. I don't want to go back to uh, the engineering side. Um, so I just contacted people through spare room and it was literally the first person I contacted and I said, guys, your house is, your, your properties are really nice. I can see all your properties. Um, I'm, based, I'm based in Norwich. I'd love to learn more about property. If you've got any experience, would, would love to come, come and meet you guys, etc." And they called me straight away and said, look, we live in London. Um, we have got a manager. We have got like our kind of, I think it's the person that did their bookkeeping at the time was based in Norwich and they did the viewings and things like that. And it wasn't, um, the, the lady doing the bookkeeping wasn't enjoying the tenant management side. So they straight away passed the tenant management to me. So um, as soon as I finished that first project, I had experience of sort of 50 tenants, which was, so I wanted the experience. Um, I think by the time I'd been doing that for three years, I then, being front line with tenants was making me lose my passion for property. Because it, it can was, do that. Yeah, it was. I was <laughs> Man trying to, yeah. yeah, managing tenants can definitely do that, can't it, Matt? Yeah, I was getting to the point where I was dreading going to some particular properties and mine was actually one of them. I was because I had some like, tenant issues. Um, and I really didn't like that. So I thought that uh, that was the point where I thought I need to pair back to what I've got. And then it was 2000 and end of 2016 where I was able to release money from the property we first talked about um, and invest in two in early 2017, one of which is the case study. So before we dive into the case study, um, let's skip over it and talk about the management agency mm -hmm. and um, it's been really great to work with you in the last the last year as you've grown that agency and it's been growing very quickly uh, and it all sounds like it's going really really well Matt but you've said yourself the you know that that shine of properties can wear off quite quickly when you when you've got tenants in there and the enjoyment of property can sometimes be eroded when you've got to manage tenants and I'm a big believer that managing tenants and managing property is, is a fundamental part of what we do, particularly with HMOs. That's kind of the rough that we've got to accept with, with, with the smooth. And, that, and that's why we, we get better returns than the single lap market because there's more involved. And I think even when you outsource management, it's still there. It's very difficult to remove your responsibilities altogether. So yeah, I'm definitely not a subscriber to the idea that, that, Anything to do with HMOs is passive. You can be clever, you can be smart, you can use the right teams and the right people, but there are still decisions that you've got to make as a landlord. But as an agency owner and somebody who's actively grown the property management company, I'd love to talk about that process and how how it's happened for you, what you've struggled with, what hurdles you, you've overcome because there are a lot of people out there who are self-managing and I think a lot of what you've been through is relevant to many many people so going back to when you first started Matt was this something that was literally you know done from the the, the living room at home and you just brought your properties in-house you started managing the viewings yourself you you started doing the tenancies how did it how did it all come about so I was doing because property was my it I was full-time in property since 2012. So um, I felt like there would never have really been an option to hand it off to an agent because um, because I, I didn't have a full-time job. You know, I, it was that was what was supposed to be filling my day. Um, but I think it got to, um, it, once I stopped working for the investors and focused on my own, so by that point I had, I had my eight bed um, and I had... Um, probably about another another 15 rooms at that time that I'd done for my parents. Um, it was still, I was finding during the week, I could have a week or weeks where I'd hear nothing, but then I would have a week where there'd, there'd be loads go wrong um, or there'd be, or it would be, and it would always be inconvenient times. It would never be like just, 
it, it never, it was never convenient. Um, and so, you, and you're always that front line. When you're self-managing, you're the person taking the call on Saturday night when someone's locked themselves out. And you as a landlord have a responsibility for them to have shelter, to get, in, get into their property. Um, so it was, it was that, that, that first point of contact that I found really difficult. Um, and also, I wanted, to be, I wanted to be investing, I wanted to be looking for properties. And if one week, I might be mid putting together a proposal for, for a new property that I want to purchase, um, if one week I'd get two or three tenants hand a notice in, I would suddenly be paralysed by the fear of having, you know, a, a fifteen hundred to two grand void the following month. Um, so I just knew I needed, I, I knew I needed a break between myself and the tenants, um, and I knew I wasn't going to get that from a high street agent. Um, so I, I knew I needed to create a position where I would have somebody else come in to be that front line and I would, support, I would support that person and that person would support the tenants. Um, yeah. And is that where you're at now then, Matt? So you, you've got some staff members that take care of the portfolio almost front of house, boots yeah. on the ground, and you're overseeing the operations. Is that how things are working now? Yeah, definitely. So I'm very much involved in the management company at the moment, um, which I'm happy to do at the moment. And I'm quite enjoying it because I feel like I'm actually working on a business. Whereas mm -hmm. I think when you're in just in property, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't feel quite so, it's not like, it's not a business like thing because you're not, you're, um, I think once it's set up, it's business because you've got rent coming in, bills going out. But during the build process, it's all your figures are up and down constantly. Uh, whereas with the management company, it's you know I can, I know what fees are coming in at the moment. I know what costs are coming in at the moment. I can do a projection for the next twelve months. Um, I can you there's predictability in it. Uh, I mean, all our landlords could leave. I think they could give a two or three month notice period, but that's very unlikely. Um, and so I can, we can see into the future. So it's quite nice working on the business that way. Um, I'd love to get to a position where we can grow a little bit more and I can promote people within to take more of a management position, um, more of a, um, a strategic position where they can have their own, they can set themselves targets for, for growing the business for that year. Um, simply so I can focus more on the actual property acquisition side um, because that's that's what I really enjoy. I mean, I'm, all, I'm always going to be around both businesses, but it's the, it's the going around the properties, the sourcing, the, you know, packaging, the putting them together, I mean, packaging for, them, for myself, as in working out what I'm going to do with the property, what its potential is, um, whether anything creative can be done, floor plans, interior design, all that sort of, that's the bit I really enjoy. Um, but in terms, in terms of the management business, I am still really enjoying just that growing something, growing something that I feel is really special as well. And I'm growing something that um, I feel really proud of. Like I just, if anybody came to me and asked about HMO management in Norwich or any management for that, so that um, thing, because I mean, sing, single up management is really easy. Um, I would, I fully, com I'm fully confident to say we hands down provide the best service in the area. There's nobody that's going to be at some service, and I can say that with like, and that's not being dead headed. I just know, I know what we do. I know what we do for our tenants. I know what we do for our landlords. So, and that's that's really nice to be able to to feel and say. You sound really passionate, Matt, about your agency and th and I think you make some really good points about differentiating between having a portfolio and also building a business and, and I agree and I, and I think there are differences yes I think you've got to run a portfolio ultimately like a business but it behaves very differently to a traditional business mm. where you've got an income stream you've got expenditure you can plan you can project you've got customers to deal with and 
it isn't as capital intensive as buying. Obviously buying a property, you need however many tens of or hundreds of thousands to buy an asset every, every single time. And naturally, for most of us, that's quite a slow process to building that. We've got to regenerate capital, recycle it. Whereas with something like a management agency, once you've invested those initial costs, you've laid that seed capital down, it's all about getting customers through the door, isn't it? And every single customer adds some money to the bottom line. That revenue continues to be generated. You can grow, you can reinvest in the company. And it sounds like you're really enjoying the process of actually building a business as yeah. much as anything else right now, which is, yeah. and, and, and being so passionate about it, I think is so important. And I think particularly in our industry where it is hard work to manage tenants, particularly the tenant demographic that we manage, who often have really high expectations uh, and, and, landlord, and landlords as well. And there is, in many areas of the country, a bit of a race to the bottom when it comes to letting agency fees. You know, there's a lot of competition, a lot of people tripping over themselves to offer a slightly uh, better or, or lower management rate, but often that isn't the best way to, to, to manage a business. Sometimes you've got to focus on things that you're talking about, like customer service, which is so important. And I, and I totally agree. I think it's an area where there's a huge amount of scope to improve uh, across, you know, almost nationally. In it. And it's great to hear that that's your key focus. What have been the most challenging bits about this, though, Matt? You, you've made it all sound very calm and relaxing and you've kind of taken it all in your stride but I'm sure there must have been times when you've kind of had your head in your hands and questioning whether this was doable whether in fact you wanted to do it have there been times like that for you um I, th I think going back to the fact I said it sort of grew so slowly um or so steadily um it's not it's not felt too, too dramatic at any point. Um, I think there were just certainly realizations around a year ago that there, um, there's quite a lot of legislation, there's quite a lot of additional bodies and things that you need to belong to um, and, and processes that you need to have within your business that I, uh, I didn't have and I didn't realize I needed to have them. So I think, and, and there's a massive cost, there's a, there's a, there's a a monetary cost and there's also um, like an admin time cost as well in all of these things um, but I kept telling myself that I want to if we go back to just personal portfolio I want to grow it substantially bigger than what I'm managing at the moment so I still need this management company and I still I'm still going to need all this sort of stuff so it's it's a really a learning curve at the moment and I'm just doing it all slightly earlier than perhaps I'd need to if it was just for my own portfolio. I think when it comes to building an agency and managing property and building property businesses, having that foresight to do things before you know that you're really going to need it and rely on it is, is so, so important. And I think it's an area that a lot of people struggle with. It's really difficult to make those sorts of decisions, to invest for the future, to make gambles on things that might or might not happen. And sometimes you've got to have faith, suck it up, put in the hard work and, and you know, hope that it, it all does does pay off ultimately. But it, it does sound like things are going really well for you and, and the trajectory, certainly when we've talked about it off air as well, sounds really exciting and um, the projects that you, you've been doing as well simultaneously are fantastic. So it sounds like the future is very bright and I'm sure that the Norwich market, you know, are, are gonna become more and more aware of your service by the sounds of things and and, and hopefully that, that business just continues to grow. What, what's your long-term plan with it, Matt? Have you have you got that far with it yet or are you, are you just kind of taking it a year at a time? So in terms of, in terms of management, it's, it is really a year a year of time. So yeah. I've set um, some targets for this year. Um, it's quite nice. It's quite nice setting targets because it gives you. Um, it's I can work back from like a projected income in twelve months' time or project, projected profit in twelve months' time. What what can we afford in the business then? So in terms of what extra people. Um, what what external services, 
um, and I can start looking for them now. And it's kind of you having that confidence to perhaps spend. So it's, at the moment, I'd really love to have somebody in house that works on client management, so on landlord relations. Um, so it would be their sole job to work on on our, our if they'd be our brand ambassador, and they would be the, the first kind of point of contact for any landlords, um, which at the size we are at the moment seems ridiculous to have somebody in that full-time position. But if they were able to drive the business to where I want it to be in 12 months' time, then it would it makes total sense. Um, so it's, it's quite nice planning a year in advance. In terms of bigger than that, I mean, I think in my mind, 2,000 units, so 2,000 rooms is probably what I have in my mind as a as as a as a good monthly turnover operation. I'd be really really happy to get to that point. Um, I mean, in Norwich, there's something like 3,000 H like registered HMOs, so each of those has got five plus people in. So there are the there are the rooms here to be managed. Um, there's you know there's there's huge there's huge student population in Norwich, um, huge local population anyway. So um, that's what I that's what I've got in mind. Um, and like there's some sort of figures behind that as well. So it's not not just completely random. Um, but at the same time, I'm really content with where we are now as well. So just trying to trying to enjoy the process. I think more than anything. I think that that is more important than anything as yeah. well Matt I think if you don't enjoy building a business it can be really really hard work and those difficult days are just that much more difficult so it's great to hear you say that as well let's uh, have a look at this case study then so this is a superb case study I'm really excited to talk to you about that and for everybody listening today Matt's case studies of course in the roadmap so you'll be able to find out a lot more about the context, the background, how Matt found the deal, and exactly why he did what he did. But we're going to talk about some of the best bits in today's episode. So the property um, that we're talking about today, Matt, was one that stood out for me, um, f for you already, because of something that you, you put on, on the front of it, um, which I'm sure you'll tell us a little bit about. You just made it look beautiful at the front. Uh, and it's quite unique to see something like that in the HMO space. We often don't see photos from the curbside that make you go, wow, but actually yours is quite a rare example. Uh, but this was a property that you purchased for £280,000. And you got this revalued after the work, which I'll let you talk about, for half a million. So, you know, a huge uplift in value. And at the back end, it net cash flows after all your costs, £1,600 a month. That sound about right, Matt? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's quite heavily mortgaged, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, £1,600 is, 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 a, is a fantastic, um, you know, net cash flow. It's, it's half of the average salary, poss poss possibly more. Um, but what's really staggering about this, Matt, is, well, the... You got all of your capital out and a lot, lot more. So the really the numbers are off the chart on this. Um, first thing I want to ask you before we go into detail is whether or not this is a typical case study for you. Is this stuff easy to find, or do you think that this was good timing? You were right place, right time, ready to pounce. Um, and actually, these the, these are fairly rare examples. And and I'm always cautious because we get some phenomenal case studies on the podcast, but Equally, it can set unmanageable expectations. So I think it's always important to give a bit of context about whether or not this represents a, uh, a deal that's consistently available on the market or whether actually maybe this is one that you really were quite fortunate to find. So how did you find it, Matt? And and and, and, and is this stuff typically available in, in your market? Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's... it's it's a unicorn. It's you know, it's, it's a it is a <laughs> it's is a unicorn. Yes. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it, so with this property, I found it on Rightmove. Um, I had seen it on Rightmove at least six months before I went and viewed it, and right. just kind of I discounted it. I discounted it because it was ugly. I discounted it because 
um, of the location. Um, and I discounted it just because it was a mess inside. It was it was chopped up into so many downstairs was basically two, two and a half huge rooms, a little box kitchen, and then upstairs was chopped up into seven or eight bedrooms, but like tiny, like sort of two meter by three meter bedrooms, all like off one another. And it's a detached property, isn't it? Right? Yeah, completely yeah. detached. Um, so, so so that's why I I kind of discounted it. And then it, it kept popping up. And when I actually had some, some cash in early 2017, um, I was like, I need to go and have a look at this. And then I went there and I just thought, for the money, so I, for the same price, so for 280 on the other side of the city, near the hospital and university, I bought pretty much a ready to go six bed HMO and let it out straight away within sort of a month or so of having it. Um, with, but no value added whatsoever. I mean, it's still so just a kind of a very vanilla HMO off the shelf, yeah, ready to go. It's still probably worth the same now. It's, yeah. it's literally that is it. With this, I just thought when I saw this one, I thought Look, it's got potential for my six ensuite, at least, well, uh, mainly ensuite rooms. Um, it's so, it's, it was in such a unique, so it was in a, a, a roughish area. Um, but it was in such a unique location, you can mentally detach from its physical location. Um, and I just thought, if this was, if I get my six HMO bedrooms out of it, it's walking, so it's an NR, so a city centre postcode, walking distance to the city. Um, I thought, if I can get six lush rooms out of this, they will let really well. And on the other side, if just because of its setting, I can get it revalued as a really pretty family home. Um, so that's 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 what made me choose it. Really, I just could see scope to really increase increase the value of the property. So actually, this this doesn't sound like it was uh, 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 obvious to anybody really, Matt, other than other than you. Once you'd and it doesn't sound like it was immediately obvious either. You obviously no. had. The skills and the knowledge to know what to do with it and could see the potential and i guess to do that you've got to know exactly what makes a good hmo work but also you've got to really thoroughly i mean if you can pick a house knowing that it's not in the best area but recognize potential to make it work on a rental uh, front as well as make it work at the back end with the value that's quite exceptional and actually I think that that is and when I talk to investors all over the country it is really the combination of those two skills that that I think determines how successful most people are just it sounds like you thoroughly understood what the opportunity on the table was and how to make it work and of course that must have come from your years of spending time immersed in the market locally yeah, I mean, it certainly for an investor, it would not jump off the shelf at all because you just wouldn't be, you wouldn't be looking in that location. Um, whereas I knew that, so although investor-wise, you wouldn't be looking at that property, I knew that it did actually tick the box for what an investor would want. So the location is strange, but it's a city centre postcode. It's literally what, if you wanted to come to North, you'd consider many postcodes, but top of the list would be NR1, and it's an NR1 postcode. So for, for um, HMO tenants coming from outside of Norwich, which a lot of ours are, they will be looking for that postcode. So demand-wise, I knew it would be there. Also, I knew photographically and internally, it had so much potential um, that, again, when it when it's on spare room, right move, wherever it's going to be, it's going to command a lot of attention. So I knew renting wise, it would do really well, and people would love living there. And we've got people in there that have been in this since two thousand and seventeen. So it's it's just they just they just love it. They absolutely and, and they pay really well to stay there as well. But I mean, I think I said to you before, I want to live there. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you see the pictures. It's no wonder because this property looks like a show home, Matt. I mean, it's incredible. And actually, it, 
feasibly could be serviced accommodation. It's that, you know, it's that high spec. It looks that beautiful. Um, and you can see why young professionals would be so attracted to the idea of, of, of living there. Um, so tell us about the refurb then, Matt. So you, you went from a value, okay, you purchased it for 280, you had your, your buying costs and things like that, and you got this revalued at 500,000. So what happened in the middle? Right, so it was about a six month uh, sort of renovation. Um, we reconfigured the whole property internally. Um, it was it was mainly stud work anyway, so there wasn't there wasn't huge there weren't any huge issues there. Um, so upstairs we took it back from seven bedrooms to just four bedrooms along the top floor, so um, three true ensuite rooms um, and one ensuite but it's Jack and Jill between the bedroom and the hallway just because we were thinking either if we sell it on as a family it needs a family bathroom family home um also if I'd recently stayed in a gorgeous like holiday cottage and I thought serviced accommodation so again we wanted that option of a, of a family bathroom so we've made this Jack and Jill family bathroom which is has been exclusively an ensuite for that for that one of the one of the bedrooms um, and then downstairs, we there's two large living rooms, and we we knocked through the kitchen just to make it bigger. And structurally, we didn't we didn't do anything dramatic at all with it. We just reused the space that was there. So the kitchen had previously been shoehorned into a tiny little part of the house. So we just knock took one stud wall down and put the island through and just made it into re reworked the floor space really um we kept one of the living rooms as the living room and then the living room on the other end uh, we divided in two for to make two downstairs bedrooms um in terms of in terms of layout it was because it was so odd before the layout was really important to me so getting a simple hallway upstairs with plenty of light um, and then downstairs, my, my vision for downstairs was to have really good lines of sight. So when you walked through the front door, so it's got double doors, just to give it that a kind of a, just a bit of an impressive feel as you walk into the property. Um, it's got a proper like entrance foyer. And from there, the lines of sight are really good. You can see when the doors are open to the lounge, you can see end to end of the property, which makes it, it's all double width. It just makes it feel it makes it feel huge. It makes it feel a lot bigger than what it is. Um, and then when you come into the hallway before the kitchen, again, the lines of sight go straight outside. Um, so wherever you are, it just the layout feels feels really nice. It feels really it feels really good in there. And I think for me that was it's important for tenants. It's important for tenant well being, and it's important for tenant longevity for them to stay there. Um, but also for me, there's a big focus on that revaluation. And I wanted it to feel like I was going for, so 500 grand in that part of Norwich is, is really punchy. I mean, that's, that, that's an expensive property in that location. It's surrounded by um, council or ex-council houses that, um, I mean, I'm looking at one at the moment to purchase and it's on for 150. So, so 500 is, is really punchy around there. Um, but I knew that if it was really impressive as you came in, the valuer wouldn't be able to overlook the fact it's close to Norwich. And uh, that property on a more desirable street would be a million pounds in Norwich. Um, and so it was just trying to get it to tick as many boxes for them as possible. So really special kitchen, really special living space. Um, and oh, by the way, it lets out for three and a half grand a month and it's fully let. And <laughs> um, it's, it's just, I mean, it's all of our. It's the, hard to deny, hard to deny the, you know, or the, 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 the really strong characteristics there that you're, you're presenting to, to the surveyor. Um, yeah. And so you can see there, actually, from an investment point of view, it would look very attractive to somebody. Uh, and, and with what you've done and the, the living accommodation that you provided, from a bricks and mortar point of view, okay, might not be in the best part of the city. But it sounds like you knew what good value for money represented, and actually, it sounds like the surveyor agreed with you and said, "Yeah, you know, people would pay um, 
for this property here, they would compromise perhaps on location because the living accommodation and everything else that's provided is, is as good as it is. And, and it really is amazing. And let's talk about this bit outside that you did as, as well, Matt, because I think that's so clever. Um, you put this beautiful porch on the front, the didn't porch, you? Which yeah. has actually transformed the way that it, that it looks. And you say that actually it's not a particularly attractive property, but when I've looked at it, and when I look at the photos of this, I it really stands out to me. It's one of those, th it, you know, in fact, until you did the case study for us, I'd seen pictures of this, but I didn't realize it was a HMO and because it's so atypical. So was that, again, a very conscious decision? Do you knew, Did you know that changing the frontage, you know, would really help have an impact on, on that end valuation? Yeah, definitely. It was, it was really about trying to sell the dream of it being a lovely family home. Um, and so, so when I purchased it, it had, I think it was built sort of 60s, 70s, and it had this disgusting sort of 70s lean-to porch thing. Um, and so I, I just, I went through so many different iterations of what to do with it. I wanted to clad it, the whole building in, in wood and make it look like a barn. Uh, I wanted to do like render and glass and make it a brand new like sort of grand design style house just just through changing the external kind of features um but they're all looking quite expensive to do um and i just thought kind of looking if you look at the setting it's it's set in the woods it's set between the the, the church and the vicarage um it's a really really green location and I, I just, think we should again remind people that this is a unicorn project. I mean, it, it sounds like something out of a dream. <laughs> to be yeah. honest. Well, I don't know. But... Most people don't want to be next to a graveyard. <laughs> um, and you, you spent, well, I say you only, it's still a large amount of money, but you only spent 85000 to do this, Matt, which I think is phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. So yeah. we, so like I said, there was very little structural work. Um, it, there were moving walls, moving stud walls. Um, there's the obvious costs. So, so four, five bathrooms, uh, five shower rooms, um, a new kitchen, uh, some some new doors to the back, so that so the, the double doors out of the kitchen. Um, other than that, we reused we we reused everything else. All the windows are still original. We just painted them grey. Um, they had that lead, that horrible, like they're brown with like that lead pipe, piping on or whatever it is. So some poor sod spent ages getting that off the windows. <laughs> um, and just, yeah, try to use as much as, because I didn't, when I started the project, I didn't have any funds. I'd purchased two properties at the same time. One was ready to go and this one wasn't. And so I was making up a little bit as I went along in terms of funds. Um, I think the, the the main building contractor underpriced and they had some issues with, with their team and things like that. So had I, I mean, I know some really good building contractors now. If I got any of those in, that would be 160, not 80, 85. So okay. if, yeah, if they came on site and if they looked after it end to end. But I was there, I was there every day. I was when the um, their project manager wasn't there. I was there saying guys aren't doing anything it's your money you're losing um i yeah I, I was there a fair bit so that i think probably helps keep the cost down and i sourced i was sourcing everything part by part sort of you know ebay etc so i was that's where a lot of the savings came i think sometimes that's the way that you've got to do it certainly um maybe less now but certainly um, when I was investing um, several years ago, I would spend a lot of time on site managing, um, possibly micromanaging to my own admission. Um, but it's really important, and particularly when you know you've got a team that maybe aren't fulfilling the objective and you can see that those difficult conversations about underpricing are coming because that is a really difficult position for everybody to be in. You've made decisions based on that price, they're potentially finding themselves in a, you know, um, an unviable position, which as investors, we don't want to happen as well. So managing that that balance and doing that dance, and I've been there a number of times, is is tricky. Um, but you've got to find effective solutions. And sometimes that, that solution is you just got to get your sleeves rolled up, get on site, haven't you, Matt? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, I mean, is it? Uh, it's an amazing deal, and actually, you pulled everything out. And an extra 30 odd thousand. So, really, th- this is a phenomenal deal. Um, and thank you so much for sharing that with us, Matt. So, again, for everyone listening, it is in the in the roadmap. You can go and see a lot more information about this case study, as well as all of the numbers and exactly how Matt did it. Um, Matt, you've got a lot of experience behind you now in this game. You're, you know, you're 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 well versed in the, the, the pros and cons of, of, of HMOs, students and professionals. I, I know that you've got experience with both. What advice would you share for people who are maybe a few years behind you, maybe getting that first property or you know second or third property under their belt and want to build their portfolios? What advice would you share with them, that kind of important advice that you think everybody should know that perhaps you didn't know at that time? Um. For me, I think the best advice is to just do it, just to get on with it, even if it's not the perfect, even if it's not the perfect deal, it's better to get that deal done this year, to get it done now, and then, you know, in six months' time, you might be able to take some money back out and something else will come along. Um, I I have lots of conversations with people where they're they're waiting for those unicorns um, and they are about now and again, but just don't, just don't wait. Just if it's going to, if a property's going to do, you know, at at least 20% return on investment on what, on your, your starting figures, then just go for it because it will pay, it will, you know, it will pay for you for the rest of your, it will pay money to you for the rest of your life. And um, yeah, just don't don't hang around. I think. I think that's saying. really good advice, and I I would definitely second that as well, Matt. That's how I got started. Just jumped in, both feet first, learned a lot, made some mistakes. Fortunately, none of them mistakes were too big, and um, it, it it paid off over time. And it didn't pay off instantly. Actually, I've not really done any unicorn deals quite like that. Um, maybe made a bit on each one as I've gone. Certainly, things have gone up in value, and I've been able to release that but definitely just getting stuck in and it is easy to procrastinate get Mm. stifled by overwhelm isn't it did you did you have a network beyond kind of your your job matt when you were doing this did you have people to support and guide you or lean on or emulate or were you really just kind of doing this on your own i'd say i was doing it on my own i really was i mean i think um instagram for, for property probably kicked off uh, I would say 2000, for me, 2018, 2019. Um, and prior to that, you know, I've been posting stuff. I, my own living account dates back to probably about 2013, 2014, something like that. Um, but prior, prior to that, there was, there was nothing. And also locally, I mean, we've got, we've got the, the meetings and stuff like that that you can go to. But I'd, you know, I'd pop along to one maybe once a year. Um, and just found them not not great. <laughs> um, so I didn't I didn't have I didn't have the network I have now. Whereas now I feel like so like today for example, looking at um, looking at commercial property, look, looking at my first sort of commercial to residential property, um, and there's lots of there's lots of things I haven't got a clue what what I should be doing with, but I know now lots of people that are doing it and especially sort of within like our network andy people that i can i can just speak to um and be like what's this what does this mean what do i need to do um and just and uh, yeah three four years ago i wouldn't have had the confidence because i wouldn't have had that kind of network um yeah does that answer what you said (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I, 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 absolutely. You're so calm and collected about it all as well, Matt. You know, you've it's you've just obviously taken all of this in your stride, um, and it's great to listen to you share this story. Um, I I know we're going to get you back on the podcast, and I, and I already can't wait for it. Um, so before we we wrap up this episode, what does the give us a bit of a taste of what does the rest of the year look like for you for for AM? Have you got projects on the table? That you're looking at now you've mentioned one or two things what do you think what can we expect right give us something so, so um 
at least for small, I, I keep saying this every year, I want to do some small HMOs, um, <laughs> at least for small HMOs, so, so four bed HMOs in Norwich that will be with joint venture partners. So there'll be um, where setting up long-term plans where a partner puts the funds in um, and myself and the team get it done, ready, let and profitable. Um, again, I wanted to purchase some small things for myself. But as I said, just now I look, I'm looking at some commercial residential property, um, which would be in my name. Um, so that's e e either that will come through or I'll look at doing sort of between two and four for myself this year um, as, a, as, as HMOs. Um, and then just, just growing the, the AM Living brand for the management in Norwich. Um, just really just building on the systems and processes, getting everything as, as good and as easy as possible. So just, just really trying to refine that. Well, I am definitely looking forward to seeing the fruits of all this, Matt, because if it's anywhere near the standard, the stuff that you've done so far in terms of specs, um, deal performance, then they're going to be really, really amazing. Cheers. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show, Matt. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I mean, we, it's always great to talk property with you as well, because you're so, um, you're so knowledgeable, uh, and so experienced. And I think the reason that you do it and, 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 and the values that you, you have, you know, are very much, you know, a reflection of, of mine. And so it's it's always so fun to talk property with you and actually we've got very similar businesses with the investment stuff of our own with management agencies uh, and it's always good to talk to people running agencies as well i know not everybody in the hmo world is doing that for good reason but <laughs> it's nice to have people in your network who are doing it who you know you're sometimes banging the head on the wall when tenants are driving you mad or you know tradesmen aren't just kind of doing what they're supposed to be doing but um it's been Really great to have you on the show, Matt. So thank Life, you so much. Andy. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, that's it for today's episode, guys. Thank you so much to you all for tuning in to listening to Matt and I talk about properties again. Big thank you to you, Matt, for sharing your, your story. It was an absolute pleasure and really incredibly inspiring. Um, we're going to try and get Matt over in the HMO community on Facebook. I know he's um, someone who... Um, tends to to hunt around a little bit more on Instagram, but uh, we'll try and get Matt over in the HMO community. Perhaps he can come and answer some of your questions and chip in as well. And of course, don't forget that the HMO roadmap is live. It's there. Matt's case study will be there as well as the recording of our video today. So you can see Matt in person. And um, of course, lots more really useful and very valuable content that will help you start, scale and systemize your HMO portfolio. That's it for today's episode. Thank you so much and I'll see you next week. Cheers, Andy.